Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our latest episode of App Transformers. We're glad you've joined us today to talk about all things modernizing. And today we're joined by a special group of folks that are involved in our JAX RPC to JAX WS conversion efforts. And um, we'll get to see today how we can do some of the things that we've talked about in the past about modernizing our applications using a, a new tool and capability. So today I'm joined by three of my colleagues. Let us introduce ourselves. Cheryl, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I've been with IBM for about 25 years and on WebSphere for like 17 of those years. And um, lately I've been working on this JAXRPC conversion tool that we're going to talk about today. Excellent. And Thomas, would you like to introduce yourself? I, yeah, I'm Thomas Johnson. I have been with IBM for maybe eight years now. Um, I am the development lead for uh, the Liberty JAXWS squad. And I guess what passes for an expert for this soap based web services and have worked with Cheryl and her team on this tool. Excellent. And Cindy is a, a repeat part of um, the App Transformers team. Cindy? Hey there. Yeah, I'm Webster Migration Tools Architect, and I am so excited about this new tool um, to help these uh, our applications move uh, to Liberty. Yeah, and I'm Dana Price. I am the App Modernization Architect. I've been um, pulling in lots of our experts across the industry with respect to app modernization. Really glad with the folks that we have today. If you haven't had a chance, do take a look at the previous sessions that we have had for App Transformers. We, today during our discussion, we'll probably talk about Transformation Advisor, about the WebSphere Application Migration Toolkit, the Binary Scanner, all of the experience that we have with moving applications from one version of Java EE to another. So do take a look at the previous episodes and um, see some of the details about the things we're going to talk about today. I encourage everyone to use the chat. You can use the chat session part or you can use the Q&A, whatever works best. I'll try to incorporate your questions into our conversation today and I do always appreciate your feedback. So let's start off. Thomas, you're going to get us starting with what are we talking about here? <laughs> yeah, so let's, I guess, kind of take a step back in that aspect. Um, we're talking about app modernization um, and maybe transitioning from like tradi traditional web sphere to Liberty. Um, you know, and, and in doing that work, one of the things that became really clear is that uh, JAXRPC remains a blocker for um, that sort of migration. And JAXRPC, as a little bit of a background, is a nearly 20-year-old web services spec um, that's, based, that's a SOAP-based uh, web services. Things have changed drastically since then. In fact, uh, JAXRPC was deprecated in Java E6, so it's been around for a while. And what we wanted to do with this tool is move, enable users to move from JAX, away from JAXRPC, right? Um, and in and to that effect, right? One of the, the the clearest solution or easiest solution became moving from JAXRPC to JAXWS. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, is JAXRPC is a um, uh, so JAXWS, I should say, um, is the successor to JAXRPC. So when we're moving from JAXRPC to JAXWS, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to re-architect your application or your or your infrastructure um, to to maybe like JAX R RS or GRPC or one of the newer web services technologies. Um, and uh, in that vein, you might not necessarily have control over what your web service provider is. So you might have a JAX RPC web service provider um, that is external to your application. So you might just have JAX RPC client code in it and you or was part of JAXWS being baked into it was some interoperability with JAXRPC so that you could have, you know, JAXRPC and JAXWS uh, talking to each other in mixed environments, right? And 
like a little less kind of side note of why um, Jack's WS is still, you know, a viable option to move away, even though it's, you know, maybe almost as old as Jack's RPC or getting getting there, um, is that Jack's WS is still being worked on in the um, Jakarta, you know, even in the Jakarta EE environment. Um, for instance, Open Liberty, we just released Java, uh, Jakarta EE 9 support and a part of that was our xml web services 3.0 feature um which is very much not the case with GXRPC. it's you know as i said it was deprecated in e6 it's remained at 1.1 and there's not really any work in that space anymore so and one of the we'll things i think thomas that, mm -hmm. that surprised me and and cindy and i've been working over the years in migration from one release of or one version of Java EE to the next, moving mm -hmm. from WebSphere to Liberty, is that you want to get on to the Liberty platform, yes, but by moving to a protocol that is now active and strategic, your your application then can take advantage of other things within the, the broader feature set. So you can start Absolutely. using profile, you can start using metrics, you can start doing a lot of the automatic kind of integrations that come with those those more modern um, features as well. So I, I was surprised, okay. kind of, but Cindy and I have been looking at that 50% of our clients' applications have some pieces of Jack's RPC still in them. I think that's the, right. if it's right. not broke, don't fix it concept. <laughs> that it's, been, <laughs> it's been going along for a while. So Absolutely. it's exciting to see that there are options outside of re-architecture. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, and it is stable, so give it that, right? Um, <laughs> so as a kind of um, a little bit of a background uh, in that comparing JAX-WS to JAX-WS. So it, part of the reason I think also feeds into that, like we were saying that um, staying with what works, right? Is that JAX-RPC supported so much uh, technology and, and interoperability with um, other like Java EE specs at the time and, and external uh, configuration, things like that. Um, and when JAX-WS was introduced, it was supposed to be JAX-RPC 2.0, but it broke so much of what JAX-RPC relied on um, in that, of all the things that JAX-RPC supported, only a small set of that JAX-WS brought forward. But kind of importantly, and, and what's critical to this, like this, the, the tool that we rely on is that the backbone is still there right? in that <clears throat> JAX-RPC and JAX-WS still use the WSDL model, which is that contract between the provider and the client. And, um, you know, both of them have implemented and integrated with a WS interoperability spec, which means that they can talk to each other. So we have a base to go on, but when you're doing this yourself, or you know, like when you're 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 modernizing this and and moving from Jax RPC to Jax WS, there's still a lot of work, right? And so we were um, set out to kind of do a lot of that for you if we could, right? So what <clears throat> what you just said, where you're saying the interoperability exists, so I can have part of my infrastructure using Jax RPC and part of my infrastructure using Jax WS. So it's not an all or nothing decision of you have to change, go learn to speak another language. Right. That these protocols are meant, are defined to be interoperating as yes. long as that subset is shared. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, there's there's there are cases that break the interoperability that Jax RPC still supports. Um, and I, we'll talk about that a little bit, um, but that, yeah, for the most case, by and large, they're both meant to talk to each other, right? And so we can really lean into that, which is great. It makes this whole process much easier, right? Rather than having to re-architect, like you said. All right, so we're talking about providing a solution, right? Um, and that kind of conversion from JAX-WPC to JAX-WS. Um, the tool, itself, we wanted to be able to basically do that in two steps uh, or two goals, depending on your framing, right? And so you start with a JAX RPC binary and you have our conversion tool, right? And the first step 
would be a validate WSDL step, right? Which is going to basically answer the question of whether the JAXRPC WSDL that you're using, whether on a client or for your provider, is supported in JAXWS. If it's not, it's going to fail the validation. But if it is, then you can run the second part of the tool, which is re replacing JAXRPC. And that's, that part is going to do the JAXRPC to JAXWS conversion for you. Um, and then once that's done, you'll have a JAXWS binary that's deployable to, you know, web sphere liberty or open <clears throat> liberty. And this binary that you start with is your JAX mm -hmm. RPC binary, and you come out the end with JAX WS binary. This is your application. This is your your ear file, your war file that contains all your business logic and some content that was using JAX RPC. So things that can be flagged by the binary scanner, things that can be flagged by TA transformation advisor. It'll say, you know, one of the protocols that you have and things you have to address is checks RPC content. So you're saying that there's a test to to get a look at your application in its binary. So just exactly how it is today deployed, be able to validate, is this a candidate for the next step in the process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. And um a lot of, I mean, it's not necessary that your WSDL is packaged within your application. Um, there are, you know, some some uses for like JAXRPC client where the app can be, the WSDL can be external. And so if you, as long as you provide a, provide that WSDL in some way, whether it's a URL or within the application, you know, we can run that validate WSDL um, goal and tell you whether or not this is uh, eligible for conversion. Excellent. All right, so um, kind of want to just start off with that aspect for that first goal, right, where we're talking about WSDL validation, right? So, and, and that is the question that that step is answering, right? So why would WSDL validation fail? Um, there's a few reasons, and they go beyond just taking your WSDL and, and, and running it through WS import, because there's certain things that we have to consider when we're doing the conversion ourselves, right? Um, so first and foremost is that uh, the WSDLs can be written in a certain way that JAXWS doesn't support. And one is RPC encoded style WSDLs. It's a very specific structure to the document by WSDL document, but it, JAXWS doesn't support it. So therefore, you know, we can't convert an app that's using this WSDL style. Um, the next is, so if your WSDL document, your, you know, Sorry, let me rewind that. Your whistle document is essentially using schema, uh, XML schema namespaces, right? And so um, there are certain ways that you could configure your um, your provider that was using, let's say, like TWAS specific namespaces, like let's say for SOAP over JMS or, or other things. And there's there's definitely spec namespaces that have been dropped. So those, if, if it finds any of those, it will fail validation as well because JAXWS doesn't support them. Right, or Liberty doesn't support those specific namespaces. And then lastly is SOAP over JMS. And so this one's a big one in that JAXWS actually does support SOAP over JMS. And in fact, it does on TWAS, but Liberty at this moment does not support SOAP over JMS. So therefore, if you're using it within your app and JAXRPC, we can't convert that specific uh, provider. Um, may not always be the case, but uh, at this time we don't support it. So Tom, you said soap over JMS was the big one, but for these mm -hmm. the the two lesser ones, is that something that they could maybe even fix or change in their WSDL to make it um, uh, valid for for conversion? Um, yes, there there are ways are, uh, around uh, the RPC encoded style whistles. For instance, there's ways of regenerating the WSDL based off of your um, your business logic, right? Um, however, that's, it's more of a provider side, right? So okay. if, um, you know, if you've got a client that's using RPC encoded style WSDL and you don't own the provider that mm -hmm. has, you know, written that document, then unfortunately you can't really change that, right? Okay. Um, and if you're so the provider, then all the clients, your attached clients yes. need to be using it as well. Yeah. So it's kind yeah. of so something this... everybody in the system is doing. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. It's an all or nothing case for okay. that. Okay. Good to know. 
Yeah, and then the soap over JMS, um, there's definitely a possibility in that you don't necessarily, if your wisdom may may have two <coughs> web services providers, one mm -hmm. that uses soap over JMS and one that uses soap over HTTP for the same endpoint, right? Just two different ways of um, sending that message over the wire, right? And the app would be able to convert the soap over HTTP provider, but not the soap over JMS. So okay. it would be a matter of removing that binding from the whistle. But may or may not be be feasible in your um for your particular uh, use case right okay um so that being said i was gonna hand it over to shells and walk you through that demo of validating the wisdom okay oh we have a question do you yeah, have so okay. after the Post JAX WH conversion, how would it impact the consumer of the JAX RPC version? Do they need to regenerate the skeleton from the new JAX WS converted WSTL? And I'm I'm thinking there's two conversion concepts here. One might be conversion using the tool, so conversion of the binary, and the other was what we were just talking about with conversion of the WSTL. And I I think that the we we address the con, the wisdom conversion that the wisdom has to be the same on both sides of the equation right. um so in that case if you if that were your route then yes you would need to have um both sides have the the generation yes. so the consumer and, and the provider would need to be the same but in terms of the the tool overall and i think this is a great question because what we're we're doing with this tool the binary that you started with your application or war and it as we show going through the whole um, equation of passing the validation and doing the conversion there's no more change required anywhere in the system at that point because you've found that com communication linkage that says now a JAX rpc provider consumer can talk to it Jack's WS provider consumer. Is that right. is that right? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. That was that last point. I think is the key point. Man, is that if I had mentioned, you know, there's certain cases where you would have to do all or nothing. But um, for the most part, is the way that WS interoperability works. Right. Is that we could leave the Jack's RPC client un unmodified. And as long as the WSDL has remained unmodified, basically if the contract's the same between your converted application and the JAX RPC client, right? Um, yeah, there's, there would be no need to regenerate those JAX RPC stubs on the client side, right? You could leave that untouched and it, you should we sh should be able to guarantee interoperability between the two. Okay. Right. right. And, and I'll uh, demonstrate during the validation, there is one scenario where interoperability is affected. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a flag for that. Um, so I'll show that. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Really good point. All okay. right. So Cheryl is going to show us the demo. All right, so it's been alluded to that this is a plugin. Um, we have a Maven plugin and a Gradle plugin. So i um, going to show the Maven plugin first um, and do a validate WSDL goal on a demo client here. We have demo RPC client.org. So this is the configuration of the plugin. We have version 1.2 came out just today, hot off the, the press. Nice. <laughs> and here we have the validate whistle goal. And so I will run this. This is a uh, successful scenario that I'm showing. And I'll show a couple that have some failures. So what it does is it expands the ear award that you gave it. It finds the whistles that are for the JAX RPC web services, does some of its own validation, plus it does the WS import command. So we see this one was successful. If we go into the target folder, we can find the expanded application and we can actually see where 
the files were generated using WS import. So if you were curious to see um, what gets generated for the JAX WS, we have that here and you can, can dive into it and, and see what some of these data objects look like and see what the uh, business implementation looks like and see our web service annotation and, and such. So that's a, a key step of the, the validation is it's running WS import to generate those stubs and make sure that they generate successfully. And you, when you're illustrating that the, the validation step, and you guys have talked about it in terms of steps and goals, this is, this is something that can be built into the build, uh, like post compilation part of your build. Right. Yep. Exactly. All right, so that was a successful scenario. Let me demonstrate um, a failure scenario. So here, uh, instead of specifying application, I'm specifying a local location. So Thomas was explaining that you could specify a URL, for example, if you were the client and you're simply using the WSDL provided um, on the server, or you can have the WSDL file locally. I think there's also a way in the traditional WebSphere admin console to kind of extract the WSDL for an application um, if you need to, to get that. So here I'm going to run on this local WSDL file. Right, so let me change directories. This one, according to the name of the project, is it's going to have some namespaces that it doesn't like. Now, this ran directly against the WSDL file, and it says this WSDL uses this XML SOAP namespace, which is not supported in JAX-WS. And also, it has the um, SOAP encoding that is not supported. And those are those exceptions that Thomas had said that this, this is the type of WSDL that won't pass that validation. Right. Right, so you find out up front that in this particular case, you know, the app that uses this WSDL is not going to be a good candidate. And you don't have to change your POM XML for building your application anyway. Right. You don't have to accept by adding that last step of validate, right? The, what in your, in your POM XML, what did you add to execute that validation step? Right, so it, it's a typical, you know, you add the plugin configuration. So here we're using the Liberty JAX RPC Maven plugin. And we also have a Gradle plugin. And you specify the version, and then the only configuration here was to point to the WSDL location or the app location. And then the final thing is um, what goal do you want to run? So it's the validate WSDL goal. And in this case, um, it's in the compile phase but you, you can pick whichever phase makes sense in your build pipeline. Excellent. What, this is one of those things that we talk about how, how powerful invoking our modernization tools into your DevOps pipeline can be. The binary scanner is something that can be invoked as a part of your DevOps pipeline in anticipation of modernization to identify you know, what what kinds of things might I encounter if I'm going to move from one version of the JRE to the next, or um, from WebSphere to Liberty, or any of the, the choices. And there's a whole complete um, list of choices that you can go from and to. But the, the power of putting that into your DevOps pipeline is that you can you can do this without the application developers even knowing. <laughs> you know, just pop, pop push all the binaries through the DevOps flow, get that feedback, and then be right. able to provide the insights onto what it would take to get that done. I think it's super right. powerful. To yeah, it's going to cost very little to add this validation to the pipeline to get some insight into um, which apps would be good candidates to convert. Right. So and, and and if they're not using Maven or Gradle now, I don't know, Ant, something old as old as Jack's RPC, you know, they they could create they could create their own little um, 
Palm just for this validation and conversion, right? Right. right. It, it's super simple to install Maven or Gradle and create a Palm or, or build.gradle. And we have examples in our documentation. So I have one more that I alluded to earlier about an interop case. So here I have a WSDL that has some um, complex MIME types. And if I run the conversion, it will fail. But then I will demonstrate this um, interop required flag. So it defaults to say that interop is required. So we're presuming that you may only be converting your service or only converting your client. And we want that interop or is interoperability to be ensured. So in this case, there's one scenario that affects the interoperability. And it's this one. We give this warning that there's complex types that are not supported with MIME for interoperability. And in the error message, let me get it right here, says if interoperability is not required. So if you're converting, if you own both the consumer and the provider, and you can convert both, then we have this interop required parameter that you can set to false. And oh, that true. will enable you to proceed and, um, and convert. So I have it commented out here. Let me add it back in, setting it to false. And we'll see and, and that. This, this piece here, Cheryl, it, it's, you know, if I, am, if I own both ends of the pipeline, and all the consumer and provider relationships are under my command. I can run it against all sides of this. I, do I have to do the validation against the consumers and the provider, or in that case, just the provider, if I'm going to do the conversion? You, you. That's a good question. You're talking about just the validation piece. Yeah, just the validation piece. Right. So. so so in that Where case, would the power be? Would the power right. be in? I feel like you still need to do both because couldn't a client be consuming a JAXR PC? From more than one, one provider. Yeah. Right. So to be 100% sure, I, I think you, you probably should do it on both. But okay. we see here, I ran it again on the same WSDL um, after I set that flag saying interoperability is not required, then it, it passed. Okay. So... For safety's sake, run it against all of your consumers and providers if you're intending to, to do the modernization all in once, which would which would help with respect to um, getting the most value across your enterprise. If you don't own all the pieces of the puzzle or you're not ready to change all the pieces of the puzzle, you would you would keep that interoperability required flag on. Right. Excellent. Okay, so back to Thomas for more discussion on the actual conversion now that I demoed the validation piece. Yeah, so um, for that, that second part, um, just to kind of like give an overview of what this takes to do this yourself, right? Um, there's a reason I think uh, that I alluded to in that like overlapping of <laughs> uh, differences between the two specs, right? Of why migrating is is non-trivial, right? So mm -hmm. I just want to kind of give you a flow of what I as a developer would have to do in order to do this work. And so first I'm going to start with the JAX RPC source, whereas the tool we're using the binary, this would, uh, you know, I of course need to be able to look at the source code, right? Um, I still have to ask that same question or find the answer to that same question where it is the JAX RPC whistle supported in JAX WS, right? And if it's not, then if I'm a provider or own both sides, then I would need to rewrite the WSDL um, in such a way that JAX WS supports it. Um, and then once that's done, or if it just was supported by JAX WS, I could generate the JAX WS stubs using WS import, and then I can pull the JAX RPC business logic into those new stubs that I've generated, right? Um, and this, Sorry, to, to clarify, this is like service side stuff, right? Uh, or provider side stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Client is very similar flow, but there's some extra things that you have to do for the, the, the provider side. Um, and so, and one of those in particular is this JAXRPC like EJB. So JAXRPC EJB endpoints integrated at like the 2X level, right? 
Uh, we're talking we old at that point because I worked yes. on EJB3 <laughs> a long time ago. So we're talking about EJB2. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And and I mean, JXWS is like 3.0, 3.1. So it's 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 not too much newer, but it's definitely right. the, there is some some work in in kind of uh, shipping that that EJB to a 3x version, right? Um, and then so once you've done that, then you've got to update your data objects. JXRPC had their their own specific data objects, whereas JSWS used JXB as the data binding. So there's some migration work involved there. Um, and you've got to answer the question whether or not you have handlers. If you have JXRPC handlers, then there's some work to migrate those to JXWS because the model's changed a little bit. Um, and then once you've done that or um, you, you didn't have handlers present, then you got to migrate the deployment descriptors um, and you got to clean up your JXRPC references. And then after that's all done, you can finally build you this build, JXWS binary. You compile binary. your application at exactly. that point. Exactly, and deploy it to Liberty. So it's just, and that was just it's, one side. That was one exactly. side of the communications. Um, right. Okay. Exactly, and, and there's it's a, it's a yeah, spaghetti of all these interconnecting parts that that have to be kind of done in tandem um, in order to to transition. And, and I think this speaks to why there's still so much JXRPC present yeah. in our in applications because it's not easy uh, by any means. Um, and, and so if you, for, if you did that, uh, if you did that on that side, um, at that point, you you might still be able to talk to all of the consumers because you're not changing. It, as long as you didn't break the rules that you had identified right. that our validation does, you, you can then continue. Yep. So even yeah. this idea of conversion, you have to pay attention to those exceptions of what can and cannot interrupt between the two sides of consumer and the provider yeah. there absolutely. the client and the server okay absolutely it's very true um yeah um and and that in that aspect um when we were considering how to approach the best way to convert these applications from JAXRPC to JAXWS you know, there's another number of solutions we could have uh, or routes we could have taken I should say and um like for instance um with what you would just seen with the um source code changes that it had to make the tool mm -hmm. could um one of the approaches would be to make those kind of source code changes that the, uh, the tool itself um and there are some some pros in that the developer would need to be you know would would need to be involved with what the tool um, was doing at the source code level. Um, however, there's a big con, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, item in the cons what, a table, I'd say, that is the difficulty of changing several files at once when one change is needed. In that, you know, if, uh, you know, there's there's about a bunch of inner interlacing parts that make yeah. it very difficult to do source code. Yeah, everything's very intertwined. Yeah, exactly. Thank <laughs> and you. If you if, yeah. Yes, if so many files would have to be changed at once, it, it would be very yeah, difficult. You, you illustrated that very nicely in that diagram that you have to go find the handlers, change the handlers. You have to go find right. the files, change the files. It change your source code it. and find yourself around all of what could be a bunch of source code files. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the other approach, another approach that we could have taken was the um, doing runtime by code injection. And so this would still be operating on, uh, this would be operating on binary, uh, but at a runtime level, which would require generation of stubs at app deployment time. So your, your Liberty starting and there'd be this layer between the application and the Liberty runtime itself that would, you know, generate the JAXWS stubs and kind of and and link your business logic from JAXRPC to those stubs as well as um, it would need on some level some interceptor or handler or filter uh, whatever your your flavor of um, message interception to alter the message to make it kind of compatible with the with the two at runtime and the the 
the benefit is that, that the application would remain unmodified, right? Um, however, this would be an impact at performance, uh, uh, performance impact at startup, as well as um, during the just the input output like throughput of your messages, right? Coming inbound and outbound. If we have a, a, a interceptor uh, having to interact with each one of those messages, it's gets very costly um, at that point. And that, and that one to me feels like there's a possibility as well of your your developers wouldn't have the capability of testing just like you would test in production because they would they would have to have the server that had the agent running on their desktop so they'd have to have this going all the time as well it feels like that what would happen in the the validation case you know you deploy an application and it, it couldn't start because there's really a bunch of incompatibility going on here right yeah absolutely true it's very very true um, so the, the solution that we went with for this particular tool was the build time bytecode injection, right? And this is what the, you know, basically similar to the runtime bytecode injection where we're, um, updating, we're taking the WS, imp we're taking the WS import generated subclasses that are for Jax WS and updating them with your business logic. And in in a way, doing what I, I had alluded to in the previous diagram with all the, all the different steps, but it becomes a little easier when we're talking through bytecode injection, right, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I mean, we, uh, we control all the, the changes and ensure that every change that's required is made at once. So. Okay. Right. So yeah. even if you're munging together a bunch of different source trees that are building, you have the ear or the war ready to deploy. You can run the validation, run the conversion, and that can then be deployed to Liberty. And right. and Liberty doesn't have to do anything special looking at it as if it were. Right. And, and there's there's no extra layers in there, like Thomas was talking about, you know, an extra right. layer of handler or interceptor. None of that uh, is necessary. So the application is actually going to perform better on Liberty with Jax WS than it mm -hmm. did running Jax RPC. Right. Because as far as Liberty is concerned, it's a Jax WS application at that point. Right. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. Um, and so just kind of an overall picture um, to speak to what the tool is is doing as, a, as kind of a final uh, note to recap. So you have this Jax RPC application, you know, uh, that's only deployable to WebSphere traditional. And so the goal here was to that for our conversion tool as a Maven or Gradle build process to convert that app into a cross runtime SOAP application that's deployable to WebSphere and Open Liberty using that JAX WS22 feature on Liberty. And so just gives you a nice, nice, neat diagram of the flow as far as deployment and where where the tool fits in in that build process. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And so now I'll just uh, get passed over to Cheryl so that she can do the demo of the app conversion. Okay, so I'm going to start by showing we have this application on traditional WebSphere. It's a simple little query application. So I'm going to start both the client and the service. All right, and then I'm going to request the information for Jane Doe, and it's going to get her date of birth and her gender. So very, very simple application. All right, just showing that they both work on traditional web sphere. Let me stop those. And what I'm going to do first is convert the service, the web service provider um, using Gradle. Let me show. Here's the demo service. And we're utilizing a multi-module project. So we have a demo repackage, which is going to do the conversion. And then we have a demo run, which is going to spin up a Liberty server, um, install the necessary features, and deploy the converted application. So for Gradle, 
once again, you have to um, pull in the plugin that you want. So here we have the Liberty JaxRC, JaxRPC Cradle plugin at version 1.2. And then down here, very similar to Maven, we're specifying an out location. So here we have the demo rpc.war that we just saw running on traditional web sphere. All right, so let me get my command for converting. So this is going to do the conversion and deploy it to Liberty. All right. So I'm just calling the demo run Liberty start, and that depends on um, the demo repackage replace JAXRBC. So that's a prerequisite. It's going to run that. All right, so let's go ahead. So it's going to expand that war application, find the WSDLs, do the validation. And then deploy it. Yep. And then it's going to do the replace JAXRPC. You see a, a, a bunch of log messages here. We have different levels. Um, a certain amount is shown just by default. If you want to see more, there's a verbose log configuration flag you can turn on, and that gets you more of the kind of debug level detail. All right, so we see here now it created the Liberty server. It's deploying the application. It's installing the features. While it continues, let me show that you do need to have this um, server XML for deploying the Liberty with the features that your application requires. So and the JAXWS22 is the one. Right. Even though your application source is JAXRPC, right. your Liberty server is going to receive an application that needs JAXWS22. Right, which was pointed out on the overflow chart and I wanted to show here. So it needed servlet and DAXWS and JSP. And then we have the application configured here with its context group of demo RPC services. All right, let's go back and see if it's finished. Yes, build successful. So that application is now deployed on Liberty. If we go over here to the demo run, we can go in the build folder and, and see the server that was created. And we can see our application here is under the apps folder. And if we bring up the message log, we can see that the application has started initialization successful. Okay. So yeah, now that good. now that we converted that application, we can actually go back to the um, traditional web sphere and start the client application. I'm, I'm starting a different client because um, this is still utilizing port 9080. So we deployed the app in Liberty on 9081. So we need the client that's gonna talk to that port. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start that client. So in this case, you have only converted the service provider. Right. And your clients are unchanged. You're running the same client that, and um, now you have one side of the equation has been modified, but the other has not. Perfect. And we see that it still got the date of birth and the gender. And if we go back to that message log, we will now see the messages that came in. So here's an inbound message that came from traditional WebSphere asking for Jane Doe's information. And then we have the um, outbound message here, which has a um, header added because this application had a handler that added a uh, header. And so we have a question in the chat for you. What what are you running? Which Liberty are you running? Are you running Open Liberty or WebSphere Liberty? And I think that comes into play of how do you when you get access to the tool. What right. what license do you have to have in order to be able to function so in which versions? In this case, um, I did not specify anything. I think, let me let me see. Let me go to my um, build Gradle. Open Liberty. So, 
So I'm using the Liberty Gradle plugin. And so this, this is open Liberty um, because I didn't specify anything by default, it gets the latest open Liberty. So, but the, the way you get the tool, um, you know, this is targeted for people coming from traditional WebSphere. So they're already entitled to uh, WebSphere Liberty, right? Based, it's, it's yeah. in, yeah. So based on that, they're able to go to Fix Central and get the, um, get the tool. Let me show here. We have this blog. I think that link is going to be yeah. shared. In it the, is shared in the, okay. yep, it's shared in our so chat. In this blog, it links to um, our support page. And on that support page, there is where you can get instructions on how to install and also links to the actual downloads, which are in Fix Central. And you <clears throat> get those by being entitled to, to WebSphere. To WebSphere, yep. Okay. And so Wonderful. there's nothing preventing running the converted app on Open Liberty, but you do need to have the entitlement yep. for WebSphere. Okay, so if we have time, I can show converting the client uh, as well. You can do that real quickly. Um, sure. Maybe if you want to talk while I get it going. <laughs> there actually, there actually yeah. was another question in the chat that, that I'd, I'd like to bring up. And that was, and he's talking about, you know, you converting a service, but then the client might be on an older JDK. I was curious at what, what um, level of Java are you injecting bytes? Is it, uh, whatever level of Java you're running at, do you inject it Java 8 level? Uh, what compatibility level? Right, so that's a good question. We do now support running the tool with both Java 8 and Java 11. Um, as far as the bytecode injection, it's a good question. I, I can't speak to the, the web services framework kind of question in that um, if your client side is, is, is unmodified, right? We're talking about mm -hmm, right. uh, going back to that WSDL document, right? And with WS, uh, WS interoperability, I, as far as I'm aware, it shouldn't matter what it has, what's in place for the client side because nothing has changed as far as that document goes, right? So right. their contract's still the same. So all of their generated code that was that was used when that original um, client was generated should still work within the context of that application and that runtime, wherever it's deployed. Whereas with the provider, that might have changed. It's for its internal um, it's processing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, but going over the wire, it, it'll still be that same xml soap message right that that's what the client's processing based on that document right. follow so, that contract so it doesn't correct. it doesn't matter yeah. so much what the uh java level is right right okay. yeah and and cindy and i um have worked lots and lots of times and focus in on the source code modification that there is this pattern of source code and i i know that if someone finds that they're able to validate whatever side of the equation they're on, and and then they decide, you know, I don't want to have a post compilation process to, to modify, but I really want to do a conversion of the source for my application. I can use the fact that it was validated as an insight into now you've got all those steps that you had. And Cheryl, you had shared something that we were like, ooh, if I were developing this, I might want to know that that verbose log is full of gems. Right, and and I didn't point out also, when the applications are converted, we uh, create this change log, which shows what files got created. Um, a lot of those, we'll see here are from running the WS import. Um, but we also have some classes that we generate, um, for example, to deal with the differences between the message context between JAXRPC and JAXWS, or to deal with handlers, we need to create a handler chain XML. 
And then we have a section of files that were updated. This has to do with um, dealing with like the different, the way the data objects are handled. And for example, in JAX RPC, you have the um, Java Util calendar. JAX WS, you have the XML Gregorian calendar. So we're dealing with those kinds of changes. So you can see mm -hmm. here all the files that were created, modified. We even have a section, what did we delete from the application? So it gives you some good insight as to, to what the tool did. Kind of in, in Thomas's chart where go find these things, go mm -hmm. find those things. There's some clues left behind. Mm -hmm. We're leaving a breadcrumb trail. <laughs> right. Excellent. Absolutely. So I can show now the, if I cleaned everything up right, I can convert the mm -hmm. uh, client now. So I had to stop the admin console to free up port 9080. And so this is converting the client application and then utilizing the service side that was already converted yeah. and deploying both of them to Liberty. And then we'll be able to see them uh, interact. And this is, this is a scenario where you could have taken off that, you could have um, added the flag that you don't require interoperability. Right. I'm converting both. I'm going to okay. change it all. Yeah. Exactly. Starting the server. It's so the right. one thing to uh, mention about that flag, right? Um, with with the flag in its current state right now, I think it's just that one case or just one specific mime case. Right. There's only one case that prevents the interoperability. Right. Right. And I think the, the intention though is to expand on that if there are more ways in which we can, like the tool can provide solutions that don't require, um, you know, developer modification. Right. Right. Uh, but that's that would uh require some feedback in that it'd be great to have any feedback on this on this being used in any way right absolutely and not working we shared the the link to the blog where we walked through there so you have access to through our communities and ask your questions there you can access us you can always come back to to app transformers and find us again and the feedback is really valuable on all levels of things that are we find useful and valuable wonderful as well as oh it would be really great if only <laughs> and that one thing so so feedback is really something that helps helps us close those gaps and make make that process of modernizing easier. Right. And so some important things to point out, I don't think we've exactly touched on is that this application that you're trying to convert, it does need to go through transformation advisor or the binary right. scanner and identify other migration concerns right. that aren't related to Jack's RPC. So those need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, if your application is moving, run it through transformation advisor, get your changes done build it without the JAX RPC changes. If that's the only thing left, then run it through the validator and then you won't have to make that kind of a change. Or if your application, if that's the only specification issue that was identified, then you might be able to use the binary um, modification tool, conversion tool. So here, now that I converted both the client and the service, we can see that we have both the outbound message from the client and then an inbound message for the service. And it's it's handling it and doing the outbound response. And then the client gets the inbound response. So it's all, all happening in one server now. Excellent. Well, this has been really insightful. I hope it was valuable for all of you um, who are viewing this and thank you very much for the questions in the chat. Um, a million thanks, Thomas and Cheryl for walking Cindy and I through all of this. It's been very insightful. Love the tool. Look for folks to be able to do that. And um, when there are new things to come out, come back and join us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, this is so exciting. Game changer here. Yeah. All right. Right. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take advantage of the JAX RPC to JAX WS conversion tool, and we'll see you at our next episode.
Thanks, y'all. Bye. 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 Thanks.